Thank you, Pastor Josh. What Pastor Josh read from the Acts of the Apostle are the first verses of uh, chapter 6. Uh, let me read for you the last verses of chapter 7 now. What happened to Stephen? Now when they heard these things, they, that is the Sanhedrin, were enraged. They ground their teeth at him, but they cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears. They rushed together. They cast him out of the city. They stoned him. And the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Sisters and brothers in Christ, we look this morning at one last saint. Made a saint by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. His name was Stephen. He was a layman of the uh, Pentecost church. And what we really want to consider on this All Saints Sunday is not how Stephen lived, but rather how he died. And what we really want to consider in this series, at the end of the series of stories of sinful saints, we want to finish by learning a lesson for you and for me. The saints we preached on during this series taught us some wonderful lessons about how to live, to live sacrificially, serving, courageous, loving lives. Today the lesson we will learn from Stephen is not how to live, but rather how to die. We Christians should know, we should know that we live knowing we'll die tomorrow and we die knowing that we will live forever. All Saints Sunday, the Sunday after Reformation, when we pay tribute, as Pastor said, to those who have gone into their eternal reward, both within our circle of family and friends, and as we will do in a few minutes here at St. Paul's, among those who have passed, who are members of this congregation. A year ago, they were alive, Today they are really alive, a part of that host of heaven. Our epistle lesson from the sixth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles identifies Stephen as one of these seven deacons whom the apostles are laying their hands on and setting them apart for service, especially to the widows and the orphans. You see, after Pentecost, there was some unhappiness that arose in the church because it seemed as though the Greek Christians were not re receiving the same attention that the Jewish Christians were receiving. And the apostles were so busy preaching the word and uh, attending to spiritual matters that they chose these seven men of faith, men of the spirit, right? Biblical wisdom. We can assume, I suppose, that Stephen was one of the leaders of this group of seven because we are told that he did great wonders and signs among the people. And the church grew! It grew quickly, it grew rapidly. Here comes the devil. Yeah, you see, isn't it the truth that if congregations are lazy and are doing nothing for the kingdom, the devil will leave them alone. That's just fine. But if somebody's really on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ, if a church is really on its mission, then you can bet the devil is going to be right in there trying to distract and trying to uh, foul things up. Well, in Jerusalem, things were going so good, uh, the church was growing rapidly, that Stephen was seized by the police of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. He was given a mock trial. Some false accusations were brought against him concerning blasphemy. And uh, we can't help but think of the mock trial and the false accusations that came to Jesus about a, a month or so earlier than that. And the entire lengthy chapter 7 of the book of Acts contains Stephen's defense as he stood up in front of the Sanhedrin and did a masterful job of telling the Old Testament story of Joseph and Moses and Joshua and David and Solomon, how the Lord had worked Abraham's covenant through the people, but he included how the people rejected God at every turn. And at the end of the history lesson, Stephen says, yeah, he kind of flunked that, that Dale Carnegie thing. 
how to win friends and influence people. At the end of his defense, he said, you stiff-necked people, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Your fathers did, and now you do too. You've even killed the righteous one, the one promised to Abraham, the one that the prophets of the Old Testament spoke about. You killed Jesus. Well, then you heard what happened in the text that I read before you, yelling at the top of their voices. They rushed at him. They dragged him out of the city, and they began to stone him. And while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell on his knees, and he cried out, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Live knowing you'll die tomorrow. Die knowing you'll live forever. So it is good for us on All Saints Sunday to remember those who have gone before us. We want to remember our loved ones who have breathed their last breath among us here on earth and then inhaled their first breath of eternal life. I want you to think about one of them right now, one of your family or close friends whom you have lost. I'm thinking right now of my one and only sister. Think of someone. And we're also going to remember this morning the saints of God from this congregation who have finished their course and kept their faith and they have exchanged life on earth here with us, with life, with Jesus in eternity. As you see their names later on and, uh, and you see the date this past year that they breathed their last, I, I wonder how many of them thought a year ago this Sunday that they wouldn't be here this Sunday. Yeah. Live knowing you'll die tomorrow. Die knowing you'll live forever. That's the way the Lord wanted us. He wanted his creation to live forever in the beginning. He created man, the crown of his creation, to live forever. But sin and rebellion came, and with it, pride and selfishness, and with it, the curse of death. You see, humans wanted to be like God. That was the devil's temptation. The devil's temptation led them to realize that they didn't have to be creation the devil said, you can be like God. You'll know good and evil. And you and I have that same arrogance every day of our life. It's coming at us. Follow God's will for our life? No. Next slide. I'll do what I want to do, we say. I don't want to do what God says. It's just one bad decision after another that we are plagued with when we take our eyes off the Creator. And as a result, eternal life is lost into eternal con condemnation. The image of God is lost, and we now bear original sin. Perfection was lost. We all fall short of the glory of God. We are lost until the Good Shepherd comes, goes out and searches for the lost, picks us up by our bootstraps, and redeems us by his holy precious blood and by his perfect life of love. God didn't wash his hands of the creation gone astray like Pilate washed his hands of Jesus. For in the same moment that perfect justice drove Adam and Eve out of the garden, the perfect mercy of God was directing them to a new heaven and a new earth. At the same moment that the wrath of an angry God was being lowered upon fallen humans, God was providing his own son to bear that anger, that wrath on our behalf. At the same moment that death fell upon Adam and Eve, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. God was already preparing the sacrificial lamb who would make the sacrifice of death for us. As the body of Adam was turning to ashes to ashes, dust to dust, Christ's body, the church, was rising up from the ashes. Yes, Christ's body, the church, the forever church that is described in the book of Revelation as a great multitude 
which no one can number from every tribe and nation and language and people. Did you hear that? A great multitude. Now I know that in this evil generation in which we live, it seems as though we Christians are getting to be a smaller and smaller number. We may come to the conclusion even that heaven is a pretty exclusive little club. Oh no, it isn't. It'll be a great multitude which no one can number. And not only that, but there's another aspect of the forever multitude, and that is how diverse it is going to be. In our predominantly white European Lutheran church community, we sometimes forget the global nature of the Christian church, that there will be believers from widely different backgrounds who will be together in heaven with only one thing in common, one thing, that they are all blood-bought souls of the Lord Jesus Christ. There will be people who were once poor who will be sitting at the same banquet table with the few rich who make it there. Those who had college and university training will be praising God right next to those who never even learned how to read or write. There will be those who were healthy and strong of body who will be dancing right along with the blind and the deaf and the crippled. There will be those who worshiped with great pipe organs and four-part harmonies and beautiful keyboards and drums and guitars right along with those who worshiped with the beat of African drums. There will be those who were famous who will be sitting right along smiling at the little people of the world who nobody ever really knew. There will be people from the Old Testament time where they believed in the promises of a Messiah who was to come. They will be standing right next to people of the New Testament era who walked with Jesus and who saw his miracles and his teachings along with those of us who 2,000 years later stand in the shadow of the grace of God. There will be Moses and Abraham and Matthew and Paul and Luther and you and me all of them knowing living knowing that they would die tomorrow and dying knowing that they would live forever and in that great celebration we will say a forever goodbye a forever goodbye to pain and suffering you see my friends there will be no tears past the gate no more hunger nor thirst neither burning sun nor scorching heat everything that on earth caused us anxiety and worry and heartache and struggle it's all gone tribulations are not a part of the heavenly life the lamb will feed us and lead us to the fountains of living water and the lamb will become our shepherd so that we can truly say the Lord is my shepherd there is nothing else I want so how about that such is the reward of those whom we remember today. Until that forever moment, however, we have a mission to be about. What if we really lived as though we knew we were going to die tomorrow? Would that become important in the decisions that we make today? How would it guide our life? Would there be forgiveness in our heart like there was in Stephen's heart? Would we be ready to give up our spirit, to leave our bodies, and to go to be with Jesus? For in the remembrance of the saints who have gone before us, we have wonderful examples that should encourage us, urge us on our way, keep our priorities stay straight, Remind us of our God-given responsibilities. Keep us thankful for those who have passed the faith down to us. And keep us focused on how important it is for us to pass the faith on to others. We need to pass this faith on because there are so many in our society who today scoff at the things I'm talking about today. They're so wrapped up in the things that moths are going to consume and rust is going to eat away that they don't even think about eternity. They want to spend all their hours wrestling for the things of this world. How sad. We are called to be Christ's church. 
many members, one body. And may all of us face death joyously, not because we want to leave loved ones, but by the grace of God that there is nothing, nothing in death that can harm a child of God. Remember the Good Shepherd saying in the Gospel lesson today, nobody is going to snatch them out of my arms. So let me say it then just one more time. Live knowing you're going to die tomorrow and die knowing you're going to live forever. Will you pray with me? Lord God, Heavenly Father, on this All Saints Sunday, help us learn the last lessons from Stephen. Not about how to live, but how to, how to die. How to die forgiving those who don't know what they're doing and being willing to give up our spirit into the spiritual forever that awaits us in Jesus Christ and then falling asleep knowing that we will live forever in the precious name of Jesus